Good afternoon and welcome to our panel on uh, replacing blind faith by critical thinking. Uh, my name is uh, Francis Shortkin and I have the uh, pleasure of uh, chairing our panel. Uh, now, our panel is actually supposed to be composed of, uh, of three speakers. Uh, we only have uh, one speaker, Matthias Bosch, here. But we'll go ahead and, and proceed. Um, and um, I'll just uh, introduce briefly myself and then uh, Matthias will uh, introduce himself and then I guess we'll have a uh, an interactive discussion. Matthias can uh, start with uh, a few uh, comments, and then um, we'll we'll take it from there. So, uh, as I said, my name is Francis Shortkin. I'm uh, presently a professor of political science and uh, business at the University of Mount Union in uh, Alliance, Ohio, in the United States. Um, I'm originally from uh, Europe, uh, from Luxembourg. I've lived in uh, in Asia for uh, a number of years, um, and uh, of course, since I'm focused on on education primarily these days, uh, this topic that we're dealing with, uh, focusing on critical thinking, nurturing critical thinking, uh, and analytical thinking for that matter, is something that is dear to my heart. Um, and um, I'll uh, pass it on to uh, to Matthias to. Uh, talk a little bit about his background and then uh, share his initial thoughts on our topic and then we'll uh, just engage in a friendly discussion. So Matthias, the floor is all yours. Wonderful, thank you very much, Francis. It's very kind of you. Yes, um, my name is Matthias Bosch. Um, I'm the executive coordinator for Global Dignity, um, which is a, an international nonprofit organization based in New York. Um, we were founded in 2006 at the World Economic Forum and we are teaching the concept of dignity. Um, we go into schools, um, we are offering workshops, we're going also, as of this year, also into companies uh, with a specific program where we, that we call ambassador program to teach and give education on, 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 on dignity. Um, so we are in around 80 countries and we reach a million kids a year and, and um, my history is a little bit different. I come actually from the patent law background. I'm, I'm, I'm a trained patent attorney for 20, over 20 years, had my law firm in Munich. And um, when I started it 20 years ago, I was always at the, the, the hope that I could only do this for a certain amount of years to have something else when I'm older. <laughs> so I thought 25 years would be good. And um, through pure coincidence, I was running across this this um, nonprofit organization, and um, my wife and I really resonated with us the whole idea, the concept. And um, I was then able, also through the pandemic, to um, retire completely from my law office and um, focus now on uh, on global dignity. All right. Well, um, let me uh, briefly introduce our uh, topic, and then um, um, you, you can share your initial thoughts on it. Um, you know, the the topic I think is a very relevant one for sure. If you think about uh, how in today's day and age, especially in the in the pandemic environment, I think we have seen even more of that, where we have increasingly a tendency of people to sort of blindly follow people without engaging in critical thinking, not having their own opinions, not even being able to articulate their own opinions or, for, for that matter, dealing with, uh, with facts. And so that's the, the environment that, uh, that we're living in these days. Whether some people would call it, you know, well, there's, uh, there are facts and then there are alternative facts um, or ideas and, uh, and opinions masquerading as, as facts, essentially. Some of it could be fueled by, uh, by nationalism and by other developments in society. So that presents a challenge going forward. And the, the, I guess the, the issue is how do we encourage, especially young people, to start thinking critically, to be able to formulate their own opinions backed up with facts and how to encourage people to also be tolerant of, uh, of different opinions yes. uh, so as to you know, bring about a, a better mutual understanding and an environment where we can agree to disagree, but we can agree to disagree on facts rather than, than opinions uh, by themselves. And uh, one of the big challenges, of course, uh, would be to see whether or not there's enough emphasis on this in, in education curriculums uh, already. And, and if there is not, you know, how could we go and uh, prepare 
today's young generation for uh, more for more critical uh, mindset. So I, that's kind of the, the topics that we want to deal with. And um, I'm wondering, if Matthias, if you have any particular thoughts on this? Yeah, um, this is a very interesting topic. And we all went through this um, uh, odyssey the last four years, especially coming from the US in the situation how international affairs and politics were handled. And so that climate was um, the, all of a sudden an issue everywhere. How do you deal with these kind of things? And and we at Global Dignity, we try to teach um, critical thinking through their own empowerment, through the self-esteem. So children should kind of learn to understand, of course, that they matter, they have a voice. And that means everyone else matters and also has a voice. But you need to use it carefully and also with, well, with reason, with, with a kind of a, a common sense and with an understanding that your opinion is important, but everybody else's opinion is also important. And that goes into this kind of this dialogue. How do you treat each other? How are you, um, are you treating each other with respect and, and with dignity? Or are you simply brushing over somebody else's arguments? And all of a sudden, there is no dialogue anymore. And, and then we had this here in Germany, these people who are questioning everything. At the end, you are questioning where is north? Um, how long is a meter? Um, are you sure that a kilogram is a kilogram? I mean, you can question everything. But, but, and then that was somehow um, the understanding of a, the very discerning thinker that you are questioning um, that an hour is really an hour and 60 minutes, or is it something else? And if you start with all of that, you never make any progress. So you need to have a basis, and that is a common basis in our history, let's say the Western history, but I think also it's in Asia the case that there are things that we rely on simply coming from um, experts, scientists. And so when it comes to the question, where is North, you rely on the compass and you rely on scientists that we develop that and saying, yes, this is North. And then you don't question that anymore. Of course, there are always people who come up and say, well, there might be 5,000 scientists saying, yeah, but we have five other scientists who say the other thing. Listen to those five as well. But this is somehow then a discussion that really doesn't go anywhere. And um, how to learn to read science, how to learn and understand, and how to have um, a critical um, discussion and even a debate is something that you need to learn. It sounds as though you know, part of the, the challenge or part of the, the factors that, that drive this is that we are now, and I'm sure this would be the, the case to, to some extent, I guess, in, in Europe as well, and you can um, speak to that more than, than I can since I'm not living there right now, but there seems to be an excessive polarization in society. And it's, uh, it's not necessarily going in the right direction. We're not seeing less of it. We, I, as a matter of fact, especially... In the United States, where I currently live, there's just more and more of it. So people are embracing this sort of, you could call it a societal silo mentality, essentially. And um, I, I like the point that you made about, you know, teaching young people the, the concept of, of dignity and, and tolerance, um, because there seems to be more of the tendency today, and this is very disturbing in, in many levels, to judge people by their beliefs, their value systems, their race, their ethnicity, um, and uh, disparage people from, from different backgrounds because they look different, because they pray to different gods and so on. So how do we overcome this excessive polarization of society? Is this, from your opinion, is this just something that, um, that we just have to live with? Is this the new normal or are there ways that we can, in a compelling way, combat this polarization and, and get back to an environment where we could have a discussion from people in different parts of the world, different backgrounds, different generations who are coming at issues from different perspectives and sharing their views and having people actually be tolerant enough to listen 
to different perspectives. Yeah, I think there is a good chance for that. And, and for us, this is in our workshop and courses, this is always this rubber band between all humans is the humanity that connects us. And that is really where it comes down to, that if you look at the UN um, uh, Declaration of Human Rights, it's very clearly said in there, we are all equal. It really comes down, we all have the dignity and we share that. And so this is something that, that I think needs to be taught with a more of a focus on that, that I can agree on certain things and I can also disagree. And it doesn't really matter where you're coming from, how old you are with ethnic group or whatever. Um, I need to kind of treat you in a respectful and a fair and a dignified way. And when that is the happening, and this is somehow the understanding, then you can start and build up a society. And it used to be like that. It's very interesting when I, my wife is American and she grew up also in the 70s and in the US and she grew up with a generation that went through the war. And there was a much more a decency in terms of how you treat each other. And not everywhere, there was huge racial issues, of course. I mean, this is, US has its own history and historical problem. But the decency you treated each other on a normal basis was much more common. And that seemed to be somehow lost. And we are feeling this too also in Europe with the polarization, nationalism. And I think it's about losing this entity that people are afraid of having no entity, uh, sorry, um, identity and having not the right identity then feels like they need to defend that, this culture, this identity of being something and defend it against others. And, and that is then losing, you're looking for things that kind of separates us, then lo looking for things that unites us. And what everyone unites us as humans is the humanity. And that seems to be lost in a lot of discussions. I, I wonder also to, to what extent part of the, the contributing dynamics to this polarization and this lack of tolerance, what role social media might play and how you know, young people, how they grow up, what kind of information they're exposed to, what kind of viewpoints they, um, they hear about on, uh, on social media. And even for the, the older generation, let's say the, the kids' parents, for example, how do we consume news? Are we still you know, embracing an open mind? Do we want to really get facts? Or are we increasingly interested in just being exposed to news that feed to our political viewpoints, for example? Because that, of course, would fundamentally distort one's perspective on things. And I guess this is might be different from society to society. I know growing up in, uh, in Luxembourg and having been exposed to a lot of um, you know, German TV and, and, uh, and French TV and consuming all those news uh, over the years. And I grew up uh, watching, um, I think it was called Weltspiegel. I don't know if that's still on, uh, on these days. But it, it seemed to be that no matter what news source you tune into or what kind of newspapers you read, the primary focus, as it always should have been, was more on, well, here are the facts. I'm not going to try and, and give you my spin on it. I'm reporting the facts so that you, know, you and I as individuals could then interpret the facts, have our own opinions on it. But these days, what you see is there's more of a uh, the, the, an entertainment aspect to, uh, to news. Uh, that some people call it you know, infotainment, a little bit of information, but with a heck of a lot of entertainment. Yes. And so when you grow up in that kind of system, is that kind of an environment maybe unnecessarily contributing to this lack of, of tolerance, a lack of the ability to think uh, critically? What are your thoughts on this? I absolutely, I would agree if that is the statement that you would say, you, you formulated as a, as a question, I would say, yes, it does. Because this competition between all those different news stations 
um, to acquire people to stay on their channel and to kind of follow that and then kind of building this relationship that goes into commerce and gets into kind of click rates and all of that. This is something that is, you know, leading away from the facts driven journalism. It goes into you try to get people attention and try to build as many cliffhangers as possible that people stay on and come back. And so, as you said, it's the infotainment. It's somehow, and it's very difficult then to really find out what is now really the, the, the news elements and what is the facts and where is it drifting into these kind of entertainment area where nothing really is of informative character. It's just kind of to entertain me. And, and keeps me on. We all feel as, I mean, my generation probably as well, I feel it sometimes you stay on those channels and it's somehow, yeah, it's, it's interesting and it sucks you in and all of a sudden the time goes by and, and all of that seems to be a really, um, it is critical. I consider myself fortunate. I still read a lot of paper, newspaper, and not go through the, a lot of TV, and, and, but I still am on, online and I need to be also for my business. And it is cleverly made. And I think the, the social media are playing this with a very, very clever algorithm and, and the psychology behind it so that you are staying on, that you will kind of get more of this information because they know how you work. They've seen what you see. They process all that and feed you with what you like. And by that, the critical thinking must die because... When I take my newspaper, everything is in there. And if I like it or not, I see it. Um, but if I only go to certain channels, only watch certain things and will be fed by only other things, I still, yeah, I'm losing the aspects of other elements. And, and that is, is uh, problematic, especially for the younger generation. And the, um, see, there's another thought that I had, I, I guess, when young people especially grew up in this kind of environment. So they're, they're socialized into a particular environment that basically informs their, their thinking from an early age on. So you're, um, you're being taught certain norms, values, a particular take on history, for example. Um, and when you then go into, uh, go to university, for example, I'll, I'll take the example of, uh, of the United States. I'm not sure if that also applies these days in, uh, in, in Europe, maybe. What we see very much these days is an emphasis on having what this called sort of safe spaces or making sure that we don't unnecessarily shock people or we have to have um, trigger warnings if people are being exposed to something that's you know controversial, something that might completely upend their, um, their outlook on, uh, on life. Um, we have situations where, for lack of a better term, there's sort of a, uh, a sense of revisionism going on. Mm -hmm. Revisionism in terms of, you know, one's own history. We have now debates about, um, you know, well, critical race theory. Some people are pushing back about, well, you shouldn't be teaching certain things. And in that kind of environment, I find it very difficult to break through. To, uh, to young people, to tell them, well, look, you know, yes, you've been, you have grown up in a certain environment, you have, you, you formulated your beliefs, and that happens uh, w when they're adults already, it's much more difficult to change those beliefs because they're, they're set in their, in their value systems. So to then break through to them, I think is, is very, very challenging. So it seems as though from an early age on, we would need to capture children and teach them in very subtle ways the values of, of tolerance and for that matter how to engage in critical thinking how to collect information how to decide what is uh what is valuable information what is mis or disinformation what is fact versus fiction so the whole notion of digital literacy and that goes back to you know, the point that we just uh, discussed about social media, I think a lot of people have a very hard time given the pervasiveness of news to mm -hmm. differentiate fact from fiction these days. And um, wouldn't that be a, a very significant hurdle that we need to absolutely overcome these days? And how do we do that? Yeah. 
You're absolutely right. I mean, you're preaching to the choir to a certain extent because my son is 14 years old and he's exactly in that kind of category. And what I hate most, not that school in particular, but, but in that generation, they don't have enough books that we grew up with. So a history book, you know, that is being proven and has been kind of, you know, by several experts before it will be kind of released into school and you can rely on, okay, that is a book where you can you know, read about Roman Empire, French Revolution, the Civil War, World War One, whatever it is, but you can rely on those kind of things. If you now go with that generation, how they learn, of course, it was advantages now in the pandemic, but they are learning online a lot. And so they are going into now specific areas where, you know, the source is much more important. So, but you also get tired of always checking the source because there's nothing you can really rely on in terms of you are sure this is safe and and and, and that makes you almost you know kind of um, cynical or it, it's really kind of problematic how can i um, rely on something and then interestingly in that context um, arthur brooks the prophet at harvard kennedy school i just attended a couple of courses says then we, we don't have enough humor to deal with that. <laughs> An interesting aspect, I really like that, because what you said at the beginning about being politi politically correct kills the entire culture of being humorous, which means you're not offending someone because you try to be, at that time, maybe entertaining, and but you're not trying to hurt or offend. And to learn that as well is an art. You need to kind of be also able to judge your audience when can I make a joke that is really meant to be funny, entertaining, lightening up the entire environment and not offending anyone? Because if you don't learning as a kid to kind of do that, how will you able to kind of do this when you're an adult? The same situation with a textbook, you know, where it's about reading about a fact and you can rely on this as being a fact book that it really is, is, is proven and it's true what's in there. Otherwise, you always go through the internet and you are chasing, okay, is this now this one or this one? How can I rely on this? And then it's, it's an endless. And I think you're losing all the interest in certain elements then because it's too annoying to always check whether these are facts or not. Exactly. And the, the point that you made, and I'll, I'll make one comment, and we have an attendee here. I'm, I might uh, see if he would like to, to join on stage. Um, there is this button here. I've never used it before. Maybe we'll get... Uh, another viewpoint if, um, if they would like to share some thoughts. But to your last point there that, uh, that you had uh, mentioned about, you know, well, having this ability to sort of maybe, you know, tell a, a joke or a story, something that's meant as a joke, um, you know, sometimes that's not the, the challenge, I guess, is to really get through to the audience and not have the audience misperceive that necessarily. And then one very interesting example that I came across the other day uh, I watched a webinar uh, from uh, Harvard Business School. There was uh, Mir Desai who is in, their, um, in the business school and in the law school. And he just wrote a case study on the Tulsa massacre in, in the United States back in the, um, I think it was in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, so it was, had a lot of, you know, well, racial components, obviously. And, and he had some visuals with it when he first taught the, uh, the case and one of the visuals was a very graphic one about uh, a lynching and it was meant to sort of well here are the facts you need to be able to deal with this is very uh, controversial it's very um, emotional uh, it, it does upset people but these were the facts and you can't just whitewash history and even he said that you know, some uh, students were uh, the first reaction was well why did you include that picture mm. well unless and until you grapple with the facts um, especially when they're uncomfortable, how can you start thinking, you know, critically? This is a very interesting topic, and it's just, this is really pure coincidence, a pure coincidence, but I have something here. I think I can kind of show this to you. Because as you are European, you will see what's happened here. This is German history about uh, Namibia, German Southwest. It's about the colony. Oh, yeah. It's very graphic. It's about how... Um, around 1908, um, the, um, the Namas and the um, Herreros were treated by Imperial Germany 
um, and horribly treated, of course. It was a genocide. It was really horrible. But this is history, and you need to be able to kind of show that. Those photos, they are disturbing. They're mm -hmm. very disturbing. But they are part of our history, and we need to be able to address that and be able to also reach people with this. Um, because we now, Europe finds the colonial, colonialistic times before World War I, and even in other countries uh, later on again, were times where the human rights and the dignity was completely abolished. It was not there. And so there's, this was uh, one article, this article, where it's also about Germany, of course, because we try to now reconciliate and reconcile the situation with Namibia. But France is in there, and also Belgium. And um, Belgium, uh, Luxembourg, I think, didn't have any colonies, but, but Belgium had the private property of the king um, was, um, was uh, Congo. And, and the way Leopold was treating people there was just unbelievable. It was beyond, I mean, this was really, um, the, he slaughtered a lot of people. Um, and, and, but this is something that needs to be discussed in order to understand history, that it doesn't repeat, that we are not making the same mistakes again, that we are now trying to kind of heal and cure some of the things we have done in order to avoid it for the future. And the climate change is one of those topics, which affects everyone. And so we need to come up with this, and this is part of the teaching, and this is part of how to, to teach and have critical thinking. And part of that, as you said, is also being clear and, ex and, and, and true. And, and that involves sometimes horrible photos and pictures. We have them here in Germany with the concentration camps and the pictures we all see as young kids of um, the liberation of the concentration camps by Russians and Americans is, um, is scary, is frightening, is horrible, but it's necessary to show it so that it doesn't repeat itself. Exactly. Well, let me see if I can give you, yeah, give the mic here to see if that works. There we go. Hi. Hi. Um, I was in Germany in 2013, so I'm like remembering, I saw that you're from Germany. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on German-Turkish cinema, which meant that I had to study both the German history and Turkish history, and uh, they have genocides in their history. But I think that every continent I lived, there are three, they all, there are always some kind of genocide history. Um, I don't have a particular question, but I have all these wonderings, and then your conversation is also adding to that. Um, so maybe we can wander together. Uh, I've been listening to a lot of uh, spy podcasts um, when I'm doing my running, and what I discovered is that um, CIA, uh, KGB, they were heavily invested and interested in the culture wars and, and in the critical theory. So they actually went to school to learn French theory, for example. Uh, where I'm going with this is that even when we want to teach history, there are all these different fact, uh, factions from the societies, including the secret services, racing to control the narrative. So in a way, like we're not really free to tell the history or the stories. We are all struggling to tell the story from our points of view in a way that it will empower us and the government, right? They teach structural history where they pick and choose to, you know, empower their own government and their, their own people. And so there are all these uh, fractions and conflicts and tug of war going on. And I'm always trying to learn and f all these uh, struggles and figure out how do I go around it when I enter classroom because I'm teaching that I can include this information, but I won't get, you know, my university president to say, well, you shouldn't really touch that topic or that's too sensitive or you have to, you know, uh, give a warning, and uh, which I do. It's not like I'm against that, but it has been an um, interesting journey and a bit of a struggle to 
includes topics such as religion. And when I teach art history, for example, when I say, well, here's a Greek statue from, you know, or, or, or here's an artwork from 12,000 years ago, which means that the world wasn't created in 6,000 years and my students' brains start short-circuiting, right? <laughs> so, and I don't want some parent to come and say like, what are you doing? But luckily I have the artwork so they can say, you making it up. I'm saying like this artwork, according to scientists, uh, is carbon dated 12,000 years ago. So these are some of the things that I am uh, pondering upon and, and, and trying to find ways to communicate to my colleagues and my students. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you guys had um, issues with this or it came up for you, so I would like to think of, uh, hear about that. That's, you raise a very interesting uh, point there for sure, uh, especially the, the, uh, the notion when you talk about you know, the CIA and the KGB, so somebody is always trying to control the narrative. I mean, the victors are always the ones who write history, right? And uh, so the, the challenge, I guess, is always, especially as an educator, how do I give students both sides of the coin or you know, multiple perspectives? Not just, so I walk into a classroom and um, well, I teach about Asian politics, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a European, well, now I'm American, but I'll bring a European perspective to the table or bring an American perspective to the table and bringing sort of scholarship from, you know, various uh, parts of the world so that students get exposed to, well, here's, let's take the, um, well, the, the Nanjing massacre in, during World War II in, uh, in China, for example. Well, there's, there's American scholarship on it from you know, Chinese Americans. Well, it gives you a very you know, disturbing picture of uh, what was a very, very disturbing uh, development for sure. But then you got uh, sort of, Ja some Japanese scholars who might whitewash history. So you want to sort of give students, you know, both perspectives, not just one, so that they have to grapple with, well, you know, how do I make sense of this? Here's contradictory information. I think if we only just give uh, a student sort of, you know, pieces of information that don't contradict themselves, they passively absorb information. Rather than if you say, well, you know, this person says this, the other person says that, and they're talking about the same topic, then I think uh, if you have these uh, these tensions in the narrative, then hopefully, um, and I'm not saying that I'm always successful in that, but then you get more people, I think, to start at least the process of thinking critically about, well, what would I focus on? What do I value? What, um, what kind of questions do I ask? Because that, I think, is the other issue that uh, very often, if we want people to start thinking critically, they have to learn how to ask the right questions. And uh, that then gets into a, another sort of um, a mindset, I guess, or an approach rather of, uh, you know, of teaching. They're different uh, in different societies, the approach is different. I spent time in Asia where the education was just, well, I'm sitting here and uh, you're teaching me, so give me your wisdom, I'll memorize it and I'll spit it out on the exam. And I remember distinctly in, in one of my classes, and it was a shock, it was a business class in, in an MBA program. And it was a, a European, uh, uh, a Norwegian uh, professor who basically um, you know, laid it all out on the table in the classroom. And then um, he said, well, we have an exam. And um, the, uh, one of my uh, classmates uh, asked him, well, well, what do we need to know for the exam, which was kind of weird in an MBA classroom. And the instructor said, well, I, I don't know. You just, uh, you give me your information, but, but what do you want to hear? And he said, I don't care. You tell me what you want to tell me in the exam. Mm -hmm. And I could tell that the Singaporean student was very uncomfortable because they were not used to that. So mm -hmm. how do we break the mold as it, as it were? Um, now, in some societies, you know, they start doing more of that. I know in Asia, they started embracing liberal arts a little bit more to, uh, to lay the foundation for that critical thinking to get away from rote learning. Um, in, in the U.S. these days, the whole liberal arts education model, which made us kind of uh, successful, entrepreneurial, innovative, and so on, it's being tossed by the wayside more and more. Um, but yeah, there is a war against it. That's why I'm like, yeah. I have... I've been struggling, like, how do I keep including material without um, getting in trouble for lack of a better word? <laughs> and um, I, I taught in Indonesia with Peace Corps, so I understand 
um, and I thought about this and I think when people, especially in more collective cultures, um, criticize government or organization or something, um, and then they get punished so severely that I think as a safety measure, they stop thinking clearly, like they self-censor and they just don't want to get in trouble. That was kind of my sense of it. I don't know what you, you know, what you thought about that. And like asking them to have a critical, you know, idea of their own means that they have to take responsibility, which would mean that they are an independent human being. And that is what's dangerous. Exactly. Because then it's a, the, the fear of, well, I might say something that, you know, other people don't agree with. So there's, there's that other dimension that we have to overcome. Um, we can't prompt, I think, people to start thinking critically if, if we don't also address the fear of, you know, while standing up, voicing your opinion, defending it, and being comfortable uh, by being challenged for your viewpoints at times. Um, but that's something I don't you know learn. how we can... Uh, yes, Matthias. I mean, that, that's something you need to learn. It's debating and really kind of having an opinion, building it, reason it, and, and even be, being, being wrong is something that is, needs to be kind of established. And, and having a censorship in education is, of course... Um, I mean, that's that true. I mean, that's that 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 is killing education. If there is this feeling that there is censorship, which is a very interesting topic, because um, when I'm, I'm from Germany, I uh, when I explain to Americans how our school system works, they all think that sounds really like government control, and 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 censorship is some of the first thing. They said, yes, it is government control because to avoid censorship. It is free and you can teach, but you're only allowed to teach facts. And this is really something where you need to have experts in there who really are not biased, are not government and not political driven and only are working on that agenda. But if you have a lot of those, you don't get this kind of um, religious or political driven something. It is about really the facts. And um, But it scares a lot of Americans when the government all of a sudden is controlling the education. It is just the opposite. It gives you the free education that's not driven by any policy. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to explain, you know? But I get it. I think what you're describing is that then you are, as a professor, free to teach without worrying about uh, having to be political or politicized, Absolutely. same on the religious uh, side, because... Um, then you are getting away from the core of your content. So I get that. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I um, taught in Indonesia. I taught in Turkey. I was in Italy. I was in Germany. Uh, I'm in the U.S. And each, each country is different. And in the U.S., um, and I don't know what your experience, um, Francis. Are you teaching in the U.S.? Yes. So um, there is this um, CEO model universities like trans uh, transitioning to the CEO model of you know doing business is rather than universities being place where you go get an education. There's um, so they look at numbers a lot, right? So the, it, it, there is this overemphasis on accommodating students. Uh, which I don't think that students have the skills or capability to be completely responsible for all the things or they don't have the wisdom. So I feel like there is this overreach at the expense of critical thinking and freedom to um, have graduates to go from school to a business like immediately. Um, so, uh, and I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I teach arts, so I think that I'm affected maybe a little less than others. Um, departments, but it's it's a worry for me. <laughs> and I, I think part of it is also this. Uh, I sometimes refer to this sort of the the tyranny of of pedagogy. You know, there's a new pedagogical fad that's out there, and then everybody gravitates towards that. But we never truly sort of look at well, does, does it fit with my teaching style? But does it does it help me bring across what I want to bring across to students? Does the 
the new pedagogy isn't even effective to begin with. Um, now, what I have done to sort of foster more critical uh, learning and critical thinking, I essentially dispense with, with exams uh, for, for several reasons, because uh, I don't want people to just spit information back at me that I told them. I'm, I'm not interested in, in them sort of memorizing what I told them. Um, oh, five. I don't see exams either. <laughs> So no and, and a lot of them are still, you know, they are in that mindset in, in a way. Um, so I, I make them feel a little bit uncomfortable by saying, okay, I'm going to embrace problem-based learning. I mean, yes, it's mm -hmm. a pedagogy, not just, you know, uh, criticize sort of the, all the, the fads. Mm -hmm. But I, I use a lot of case studies and they say there's no right or wrong answer. You look at, there, there's some facts in the case, but then how do you, if you were in the shoes of the protagonist of the case, how do you address the issue? And that, I think, um, if I do it often enough and if students are used to it, then they begin to think a little bit more critically. They can make connections where they, they previously may not have uh, thought about it. They come up with, you know, innovative ideas. They may not always be right, but then the point is not right versus wrong. It's about how do you train your brain to tackle a problem? Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, uh, let's see, four minutes left. Um, I'll, I'll give both of you sort of uh, maybe the, the floor for the last couple of minutes if you want to make any last minute uh, comments and, and then. I'm just happy first. to hear uh, that you don't do exams because it took me a while to convince uh, some of my department uh, heads that why I was not giving quizzes and exams. And um, I, I think it's similar what you're describing to some other projects that I do. So um, that's that's a nice uh, nice thing to hear. <laughs> uh, but I will, I think I, I spoke a lot more than I anticipated. So I'm just gonna um, let Matthias take over. And, and we're happy that you joined us by the way, since you know we were supposed to have two additional uh, participants. Yes. So uh, thank you for, for joining. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Matthias. Yeah, what I really enjoyed um, now, to this kind of um, teaching and understanding. When I went now to, to, to the Kennedy School, I really enjoyed this kind of um, weekly papers we had to write about kind of reflection papers, which means you are really kind of trying to summarize what you have learned in that week in a paper two pages long. And that urges you to really think critical, to formulate it, understand it, and bring it together. And it will be then sent in. And you have also at the end of your courses, you have really a library of weekly papers, how you thought, and you see the development. I think that was a way I really enjoyed a lot. Of course, learning in specific topics, it's easier to do a test. If you do math, it's easy to kind of do that. But when it comes to these kind of management understanding, um, in this case, it was how to run into nonprofit organization, the understanding, the critical cases we had to analyze and go through, I think it was extremely useful to go through that with a reflection paper that was for you. Of course, we are adults and we learn for ourselves. You're not 12 year olds and learn for and study for the parents. But that is, was a style I really enjoyed for critical thinking also. Francis, you All right. Well, we could go on for forever on, on, the, on this topic for sure. Because um, it is, as I mentioned at the uh, outside, a very relevant, very timely and uh, you know, very critical topic. Uh, the challenge for us to, to prepare uh, future generations to, to tackle the big issues that can only be done with, you know, um, with critical thinking, uh, tolerance for alternative viewpoints and, and or different different perspectives, rather. Um, unless and until we do that, I think we have more challenges and more hurdles down the, down the road. And uh, today, more than ever, I think, is, is the time to, to get people to sort of Take a step back, not just blindly, as our topic for, uh, for our panel said, not just blindly buy into what somebody else says, but craft your own opinion, have uh, your facts that support uh, uh, your, um, your statement and, and so on. Um, so thank you very much for, uh, for sharing your thoughts. Um, and uh, I hope we can um, you know, stay in touch. Uh, feel free to, to reach out. I know Matthias and I already connected. Um, uh, so uh, we're, we're all on, on LinkedIn, so uh, drop us a note if you'd like, um, and uh, we can keep the discussion going in, in some uh, uh, 
uh, shape or form maybe in the future. But thank you very much for, uh, for taking the time to join this panel today. Thank, thank you very you. much, Francis. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.